Well, hello again. Welcome back into the Alan Derry Show. We may not have much music in the next hour, but I think we'll have some very interesting conversation. Our guest this morning, as we have stated earlier, is Raymond E. Fowler, who is chairman of the NICAP uh, Massachusetts Subcommittee. Good morning, Ray. Good morning, Alan. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning and to be with your radio guest for an hour. I think we can uh, have a lot of fun in the next hour, and I know I'll get a lot of questions answered that I want to know about. First of all, what is NICAP, so people will know? NICAP is the abbreviation for the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena in Washington, D.C. It is a civilian group made up of thousands of people who are interested in UFOs. On our Board of Governors, we have outstanding scientists, and on our panel of special advisors, we have men from all walks of life, many experts in their own technical field, all of whom are convinced that there is something to UFOs, that UFOs could be interplanetary. Well, how about yourself, Ray? After studying the subject for 19 years, I've come to the conclusion that there is good observational evidence that UFOs are interplanetary. That is, a certain percentage of the UFO reports coming in not only in this country, but from other countries. Let me ask you, has Russia, for example, uh, ever seen UFOs that caused their scientists to get pretty concerned? The UFOs have not left Russia alone by any means. In fact, there was a UFO flap back there in the earliest, early 60s, and uh, on May Day, they had an outstanding scientist get up and tell the Russian people that UFOs were a bunch of nonsense and capitalist propaganda, and what they were seeing uh, was just this. They, the Russian government and the other governments throughout the world have the same attitude toward UFOs. Uh, each government is carrying on an intensive secret investigation, and their present attitude is that the public is not ready to know what UFOs truly are, and therefore uh, carrying on an intensive secret investigation on one side and explaining UFOs away on the other side. Let me stop you, Ray, for just a minute. You say that the government feels that the people aren't ready to know? That's what, right. What do you mean by that? Back in 1961, Brookings Institute was commissioned by NASA to investigate uh, the consequences, uh, the impact, if you will, upon society as we know it, if it were known that there was superintelligent life visiting us. Brookings Institute made a thorough study. I have a copy of the report home. I didn't bring it with me this morning. And and their overall conclusion was that there could be a stock market crash, that um, people, uh, people's religious uh, life could be affected, uh, orthodox science could not accept this, this revelation. Maybe you'd like me to quote from this, this document. Yes, I wish you would. The fundamentalist and anti-science sects are growing apace around the world. For them, the discovery of other life would be electrifying. And this is a very interesting uh, statement right here. If superintelligence is discovered, the results become quite unpredictable. It has been speculated that of all groups, scientists and engineers might be the most devastated by the discovery of relatively superior creatures, since these professions are most clearly associated with the mastery of nature rather than with the understanding and expression of man. One can speculate, too, that the idea of intellectually, intellectually superior creatures may be anxiety-provoking. And it goes on and on, covering the various aspects of life as we know it and how uh, we would be affected. It's a very pessimistic picture. Well, Ray, you have yourself, of course, uh, performed many investigations of so-called sightings, haven't you? Yes, I've performed quite a few investigations, especially during the last few years. Well, recently, I, I don't know the exact date, it was last month, I think around the 9th, if I'm not mistaken, there was a sighting of some sort in New Hampshire. Are, are you aware of this? Yes, I personally investigated this sighting. It's one of the best we have in our local NICAP subcommittee files. Can you tell if us about like, it? I'd like to tell you about it. Hmm. The report, the sighting rather, took place on September 3rd of, last, of this year, last month, in the Exeter, New Hampshire area. Officer Bertram of the Exeter Police Department was patrolling the roads around Exeter around 12, 12.30 in the morning, early in the morning. He came across a woman all alone parked in the car, and uh, he was very interested to see what she was doing there, so he pulled up to the car and said, what are you, what, what's wrong with you? And she could hardly talk, she was so frightened, she said that she had been chased by this egg-shaped object, surrounded with a red glow and with pulsating red lights. 
Well, he thought the woman was uh, either drunk or, or something was wrong, <laughs> and he, he talked to her and tried to comfort her, and he didn't even bother to take the woman's name and address. He just shrugged his shoulders, he said, and, and drove off and left her there. Mm. About a half hour later, he said, as he's patrolling along the roads, he gets an emergency call from the uh, police headquarters at Exeter to report immediately that a boy, Norman Muscarello, uh, hitchhi hitchhiking between Amesbury and, uh, and Exeter, uh, was chased along Route 150 by the same object. He was almost in a state of shock by the time he got to the police headquarters. And he was told to report immediately to pick this boy up and go back and make an investigation. And he was pretty mad at himself for not getting the woman's name and address at that time. Oh, to make a long story short, he brought the boy back to the field, still not really believing the boy's story, but interested enough to make an investigation. Now, these are reputable police reputable officers. Reputable police, police officers, right. We have checked their background. In fact, the Saturday Review has checked their background thoroughly before. I don't know if you're aware of it. They, they carried a story on our investigation. But back back to the, the sighting. Let, let's start with Norman Muscarello. He was hitchhiking between Amesbury, Massachusetts, and Exeter, New Hampshire. And he was going along this farm road, and all of a sudden, to his right, the whole field lit up a bright red glow. He said it was just as almost as bright as uh, dusk, uh, dawn or, or daylight. And he looked, and this object, about 85, 90, 85 to 90 uh, feet in diameter, was coming across the field directly at him. It was carrying five bright red pulsating lights, which flashed in sequence, one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one, over and over again. And as it moved across the field, it was tilting. He took one look and got up against the stone wall, uh, terrified. The object continued across the field and stopped and hovered over a house a bare 30 feet from the boy. It stayed there for a long five minutes, and then it moved back over the field. Um, Norman got up and started pounding on the door, and here it was about 1.30 in the morning, and he woke Mr. and Mrs. Carl Russell up, and they came to the window and looked out, and he shouted, I'm in chase by a flying saucer, let me in. And they thought he was drunk or something. They wouldn't let him in at all and told him to get lost. So poor Norman took off down the road toward Exeter. He was picked up by a car and was brought to the police station. And that's where Officer Bertram comes into the act. Officer Bertram returned to the field. They walked across the field together, flashing their light, his light, the officer flashing his flashlight around, looking for the object. And Bertram said that he was just about to give up when the boy yelled, look out, here it comes. And sure enough, he said at treetop level, coming right at them, was this big object carrying five bright red pulsating lights. Bertram said that the boy just stood petrified, and he himself drew his revolver before he knew what he was doing. And the object stopped momentarily and then tilted and started right at them. Bertram said it came so close that all he could see was red, and he had the feeling that he was going to get burned, although he didn't feel any heat. He yelled for the boy to take cover, and the boy couldn't move, so he grabbed the boy and practically dragged him across the field to the cruiser. Meanwhile, the object stayed out over the field uh, a mere 500 feet away from the cruiser, tilting back and forth. No noise at all. A call was made to Exeter Police Headquarters to send another cruiser, and Officer Hunt arrived on the scene shortly after. Both the officers and the boy watched this object for 10 minutes before it moved off. And did it move off, Ray, at tremendous speeds, as most reports indicate? No, it didn't. It moved off very slowly, tilting as it went. No sound whatsoever. It's very interesting to note, however, that the horses in the adjoining barn were uh, making a terrible noise, kicking their stalls, and the dog across the street was howling. The Air Force was very interested in this when they made their investigation the next day, and an interesting question asked the residents in that area. They, they asked some of their chickens woke up, if their chickens were affected. Is that so? And uh, this is because a chicken, chicken has a different hearing range than a horse or a dog or a man. In other words, there might have been a sound of this thing which the human ear couldn't have heard, but maybe chickens did. That's right. Hmm. Okay, we're 13 after 11. Our guest this morning, Ray Fowler, who is associated with NICAP, he's chairman of the local subcommittee. A moment ago, Ray, we were talking about a UFO up in the Exeter, New Hampshire area, and you gave quite a quite a description of the people who spotted it, including a couple of officers. I understand a little later on in the Amesbury News, they uh, ran an article which said the UFO identified in that area was an advertising gimmick. 
and uh, it said that it was a flying billboard which contains about 500 high-intensity lights that spell out an advertising message. Now, I know you followed up this article and found the truth to be. Every time this advertising plane flies, it is owned by Skylight Advertising Company in, in Boston. It causes UFO reports. Hayden Planetarium, Smithsonian Institute, and ourselves receive a UFO report practically every time it flies. Of course, every time we make an investigation of any UFO sighting which sounds similar to this advertising plane, we call up the company's manager and get it, his exact flight plan for that night. Mm -hmm. uh, the plane, the advertising plane, never left the ground at Beverly Airport between August 21st and September 10th. So this would rule out the advertising plane. The company's manager also said he doesn't advertise between 1 and 3 o'clock in the morning over... Uh, Arms. <laughs> <laughs> Plus the fact that I'm sure he has a motor in that thing, which makes a noise. That's right. And the other, of course, was silent. Well, Ray, uh, what about yourself personally? Do you feel that uh, Uncle Sam perhaps uh, has a little more information than he's dishing, dishing out to the public? Uh, how do you feel about it? Well, over the years, as I've, as I've studied UFOs and the Air Force investigation and their attitude, Plus, looking at looking over the various regulations, United States Air Force regulations, you can see that they are carrying on an intensive investigation, but to the public, their attitude to the public is that, well, every year they come out with a statement stating that UFOs are either one or two things. They're either misinterpretation of national phenomena such as medias, uh, comets, uh, sun dogs, or misidentification of common man-made objects, uh, weather balloons and our satellites and aircraft seen under, under an unusual condition. Well, Ray, in your own investigations, uh, what percentage do you find are natural phenomena? I find uh, a good solid 20% are unknowns. Natural phenomena such as meteors, sun dogs, uh, we get very few reports concerning these. Most of our reports are Echo 1 and 2, the advertising plane, weather balloons, or planes in the distance reflecting sunlight. In some cases, seagulls reflecting sunlight from a distance. Most of our false reports, false unknowns, are of man-made objects. Mm -hmm. Now, of any of these UFOs that uh, you've investigated, has there ever been any evidence of contacts between intelligent life in these machines with life here on Earth? As far as we're concerned, no. We've investigated every major claim of so-called contacts. Of course, there, there are three major thrusts or views in ufology. We want to call it that for want of a better term. There is a group called a contactee group made up of, I would call, almost religious cultists who believe, yes, that UFOs are interplanetary and they have come to save us from atomic annihilation. Uh, they've landed in their backyards, they've invited them into their ships and taken them to Venus and Mars and so forth. And then, of course, way over on the other end of the spectrum, you have the Air Force denying that UFOs exist, even uh, coming out with statements that uh, the unknowns, the 10.7 unknowns that the Air Force carries in, in their files could be explained if all the information were available. Right in the middle of these two views, a mediatory position, if you will, is NICAP, and NICAP is convinced and has observational evidence to show that there are intelligently operated objects coming into our atmosphere uh, under control. And if you study these reports over, over the years, you can see that this is so. There are many reasons that we could readily assume that these objects are intelli under intelligent control. Perhaps you would like me to go into some of these. I'd like to ask you something first. Where do you think they're coming from? I have the slightest idea. When I was out to Washington State on a business trip for Sylvania recently, I came in contact with the Washington State Subcommittee Chairman, a Dr. Pillay at Boeing. He is a, an astronomer there holding a degree in celestial mechanics. He feels that they are from either from Mars or using Mars as a base. But most astronomers, most astronomers will will state that life as we know it cannot exist in our solar system. Life as we know it probably exists in our galaxy somewhere, 
but the distances between their star systems and our star systems are so vast, so great, that it is really inconceivable that uh, such a contact could be made, a physical contact, if you will, between our race and their race. I'm still a little bit in the dark. If, if we, of course, it doesn't have to be our kind of life, Ray. That is the, that, that's right. And you hit, her, hit the nail right on the head. It doesn't have to be our kind of life. However, it's very interesting to note that those UFO cases and reports and sightings that have involved beings, the, they are humanoid, three and a half to four feet tall and humanoid. And there are documented cases uh, with policemen, for example, as witnesses watching the, these beings as, as strange and as fantastic as it would seem. This would lead me to believe that perhaps we might be wrong about life in our solar system. But then again, even astronomy is an observational uh, uh, science. We haven't been to Mars. We haven't been to Venus. It's strictly observational. All right. Didn't we send Mariner 4 up in the Mars area? Yes, we did. And we only saw a very, very small portion of Mars. Of course, that portion looked very inhospitable to, to life. But I have read articles since then by men who are still convinced that life exists on Mars that this was just scratching the surface, it's this, this Mariner shot, if you will, with so much more to learn. Well, true. Those photographs, I guess, were taken six, 7,000 miles above the surface, weren't they? Right, and you've got to realize that even our own Tyros weather satellites, satellites which take pictures of our Earth, very rarely show any signs of life here. Hmm. No, but by the same token, the spe spectroscopic readings of the planet Mars have shown that there's practically no oxygen up there for a human to exist on anyway. Well, suppose you went back thousands of years ago. This is just a theory. Suppose Mars once did have an atmosphere like ours, once did have oceans, mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of years ago. And a race adapted itself to the climate which Mars has now and the terrain and so forth for a place that uh, is more suitable for a colonization, for example. This was a theory uh, advocated by the United States Air Force way back in 1947. A Lieutenant Colonel O'Dell in Project Blue, let's see, it was a project, project, I guess it was a project sign report at that time, came out with this, this statement. Of course, it's just theory. We really don't know. Well, I read a hypothesis on, uh, on the canals of Mars one time where a fellow stated just about as you did that perhaps there was an atmosphere like ours up there at one time, and they knew that gradually it was changing, so they tapped the polar caps and ran water through these canals, and the beings up there conceivably could live in glass houses. The water would feed plants in the glass houses, and of course, through the process, give off oxygen. This was also just a hypothesis. Right, well, the evidence for canals is very remote. Although we have men, such as Dr. Fred Singer, who is scientific advisor to President Eisenhower, coming out with statements that it could very well be, and he is almost convinced that the satellites of Mars, Deimos and Phobos, are, could very well be artificial in nature. Dr. Pillay, when I was out at Boeing, uh, brought the same theory up. So you see there are scientists on both sides of, of the coin, as it is, some saying yes, it could be, and some saying no, impossible. And yet both of them very it, intelligent. Right, very yeah. intelligent, holding uh, degrees and technical training, what have you. Ray, let's uh, hold off for just a moment here. I think we have nine or ten commercial words. The voice of the city comes alive on 85 WHDH is Boston. Well, our guest this morning is Raymond E. Fowler, who, of course, is chairman of uh, NICAP, the Massachusetts subcommittee. And, Ray, I understand last year sometime, I think it was in April, down in New Mexico, there was a sighting, not only of a UFO, but also of possible life on it. Can you tell me about it? Yes, I'd be glad to. This is one of the best recent unknowns involving humanoids, although this has taken place since then in other countries and in the United States. But this sighting took place in Socorro, New Mexico, on April 24, 1964. The time was about 5.40 p.m. The witness was a police officer, a reliable one at that. Police officer Lonnie Zamora was chasing a speeding car on South Park Street down there, and he had his windows down, he heard this loud roaring sound. And he looked to the southwest and saw this cone-shaped blue flame in the sky descending. 
he took one look at this and decided he'd better stop chasing the car and investigate this because there was a dynamite shack over there and he thought it had blown up. So he radioed back to headquarters that he was going out to investigate this explosion that had taken place. And we went up a back road and came to the top of a small hill. And he looked over into a gully uh, beside another hill and he saw what he first thought was a car overturned with its two occupants standing beside it uh, looking at it. He took another look, however, and uh, the two occupants seemed too small. He said they looked like small, very small men or, or two boys. He was about 800 feet away at this time. Took another look, and it, this look revealed that this was not an automobile, but an egg-shaped object on stilts or legs, and the two figures seemed to be working on the object. Well, one turned and looked up the, at the, the cruiser, and uh, Zamora realized that this wasn't his imagination and radioed back to headquarters again to send help that he was going to investigate this. So he drove down the hill into a gully t toward the hill where the gully was, and he lost sight of this object for a few minutes. But when he got up on top of the second hill and looked down, there, just about 150 feet away from him, was this object, white, metallic, egg-shaped, about the size of an automobile, and about four to five feet in, in, in uh, width. He radioed again that he was getting out of the car and he started toward the object. The figures, or whatever they were, were gone. He got to be about a hundred feet away from the object and all of a sudden an ear-splitting roar came from the object and blue flame came from uh, underneath it and he thought the whole thing was going to blow up in his face. So he ran over to the other side of the hill and, and got down, crouched down and watched it. He watched it take off. It got up to about 20 feet off the floor of the gully, and then the blue flame shrank to nothing, and a high-pitched whining sound came from the object, which rapidly lowered to a low-pitched sound, and then he said it was so quiet you could hear a pin drop, and then it moved off out of line of sight. In a few seconds, the state police arrived, a Sergeant Chevet of the New Mexico State Police, and both of them went down to the spot where the object had been. And there were four heavy indentations made by the legs of the object, and the ground and the vegetation were still smoldering. For the rest of that week and into the next week, many other reports of this object were received. I got many newspapers from that area, and uh, the whole area was terrorized by this thing, whatever it was. Did you have a committee down there, Ray, that Yes, we did. This? In fact, uh, our uh, committee chairman down there made an investigation right alongside the Air Force. Of course, this was so public that people were all around the place. They had a cord in the area off. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Hynek, J. Allen Hynek, uh, is out at Northwestern uh, Observatory, director, and, director of Dearborn Observatory out there, made the investigation for the Air Force. And afterwards, he said, quote, I found nothing that tends to discredit Zamora. I am more puzzled now than I was when I arrived here. Sergeant Chevet said of the witness, Lonnie Zamora, Lonnie is not a man to be easily frightened. That thing must have made an impression him, on him to scare him like it did. Dr. Lincoln La Paz, one of our uh, country's leading experts in, in uh, meteorite research, is a personal friend of Zamora's, and he came to Zamora's rescue. I guess he thought that Zamora was going to receive a lot of ridicule and said that Zamora was an excellent observer, that he had worked with Zamora for 16 years. Mm -hmm. So it was a very reliable witness, and there was a very reliable witness involved, and here we had an object, an egg-shaped object with humanoids. <laughs> Ray, we'll be back. This is so interesting, uh, and I'm sure our audience feels the same way. We have to make a break now for news and a commercial word prior to that, and uh, if there's anyone out in our audience who has anything that would be of interest to you, uh, I'm sure they'll give us a call during the five minutes of news, but then we're going to bring Ray back into the studio. <laughs> The voice of news, WHDH, News Boston. Hello again, this is Alan Derry saying we've gone through our five minutes of news together, and uh, now we're back in the other studio with Raymond Fowler, who we've been discussing UFOs with this morning, different sightings, and how he kind of feels uh, about the possibility of uh, life elsewhere in our solar system, and whether these visitations, if they are actually visitations, are coming from another planet. Ray, I was talking to a uh, lad out cafeteria who belongs to a UFO group somewhere in this area. I don't know the name of the group. But he said at the last meeting, uh, all members who had taken any photographs of uh, 
you know, unidentified, unidentified flying objects, uh, bring them in, and they did. And he said they were remarkably clear and good, and he's a photographer himself here at the uh, station. He said they were not retouched in any way whatsoever, that uh, most of the shots they had were of disc-shaped objects, which apparently uh, comes from the mothership, if there is such a thing as a mothership, which is usually cigar-shaped. Now, have you seen any photographs? Yes, uh, we have a lecture, UFO fact uh, or fiction, or UFO facts about unidentified flying objects, we're calling it now. And in this lecture, uh, we have authentic UFO photographs. One set released by the president of Brazil. A photograph of a satin-type configuration UFO was taken from the deck of the IGY ship Almirante Saldana back in the 50s. And uh, four excellent photographs were taken by uh, Almiro Barona, a photographer who had his uh, camera set up on deck to take training exercises at the time. This is just one of many authentic UFO photos that we do have. Edward J. Ruppelt, former head of Project Blue Book for the Air Force, came out with a book back in the late 50s and uh, wrote an expose of the Air Force investigation without breaking security, and he mentioned that the Air Force has many fine pictures of UFOs which have not yet been released. Well, then why does the government decisively say that uh, there's nothing to them? They can all be explained. We have mentioned the one possibility, in fact, not possibility, but true fact that the public right now, and not only in the United States, but throughout the world, this revelation we are, we are not ready for, number one. Number two, no government would want to admit officially to the public that there are objects under intelligent control coming from we no no we don't know where they're coming from we don't know what they're here for and there's nothing that we can do about them and that is another reason another reason i'm sure is that they're trying to find out what makes these things tick can you imagine what it would do to uh, aircraft industry if we could find out the method of propulsion mm. uh... one of the Sighters of a UFO uh, in this area is chief scientist at a leading electronics company in this area. And his main reason following UFOs and being a member of NICAP is to uh, do research on the possible propulsion system of these UFOs. And I'm sure the Air Force, our government, uh, are doing a lot of research in this area. Are there any theories raised to how they are propelled? And not having a technical mind, I, I can't go into that at length, but I might point out that in many cases, many, many cases, not only in this country, but throughout the world, UFOs hovering near automobiles have caused uh, complete ignition failure, radio failure, and headlight failure. Just this year, in January, and Mr. Charles Nee, I think he's president of the National Heart Association for that section of New Hampshire, was driving up near Enfield, about 60 miles an hour along this road, and all of a sudden everything went dead. His radio, his ignition, uh, his lights. He pulled over the side of the road and got out. He heard this high-pitched whine, and he looked up, and he said this object was up there. It was so bright, it was just like taking a flashlight at arm's length and letting it have it right in the eyes. Hmm. He just watched it, and it hovered there for maybe 20 or 30 seconds, and then it moved off. And when it did, he was able to start his automobile. The lights flickered on, and the radio came back on. But this is just one of hundreds of reports, not only from this country, but other countries. Of the same The same problem. right. This doesn't happen in all cases, and it's sort of paradoxical. One might even theorize that it's directed. <laughs> Pretty uncanny. Listen, we're going to pause for a minute here, Ray. We have a word from the Zara people, and then we'll be back with more chatter. I don't know. We left off with, uh, I guess, you telling us a little bit about these, the pictures that had been taken from a boat in South America, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. off Trindade Island in Brazil. You know, if we had any people out in our audience who were interested in this UFO... I have to call it a problem because there aren't any real answers to it yet, apparently. Uh, are there clubs locally that they can get into? Yes, there are clubs locally that they can get into. There's a New England UFO study group in Quincy. They might write, I haven't his address right offhand, but Mr. Steve Putnam uh, in Situate, I believe it is. Uh, better still, our local subcommittee has available for those of you who are interested out there in the radio audience free literature concerning the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena and our local work here. If any of you are interested in uh, receiving this information, just write to Ray Fowler, Wenham, 
Massachusetts, that will be sufficient. And if you have any reports that you know of or people who have seen UFOs, please send me their names and addresses and the approximate date of the sighting, and we will look into these. You know, Ray, we might explain to people that uh, there is a kooky side to this UFO business, and then there's the legitimate side. For example, there are people who write books. I have one in front of me right now called The Secret of the Saucers. It's put out by the Amherst Press, which I think is out in Wisconsin, if I'm not mistaken, by a fellow who has a uh, UFO magazine that he sends out periodically, which uh, I guess has some legitimate listings uh, of sightings that have occurred, but generally he makes this a fictional thing all the way through, and I think it spoils the whole picture for people who are sincerely interested in finding out what UFOs are. Like, for example, in one of these books, he tells about taking a trip to Venus, if I'm not mistaken, and to Mars, which is, you know, just so much hogwash. How does your group feel about people like this? We've investigated all major contactee claims, as we call them, and have found that every single one of them, without exception, has been fraudulent. Unfortunately, uh, as P.T. Barnum once said, it's a sucker born every, every minute. <laughs> there are people looking for a way to make easy money. There are other people who are looking for public attention, attention drawn to themselves, seeing their name in the paper and so forth. And uh, this type of person uh, comes out with books like this. I know one, the late George Adamski came out with several UFO books. He started out as a janitor at Mount Palomar. Uh, gardens at the foot of Mount Palomar, and, and uh, he, he must have spent his lunch hour looking through the telescope and visualized right. many things. But know. his books netted him hundreds of thousands of dollars and quite a reputation, worldwide tours and uh, visits with royalty and so forth. Mm. Janitor, right up to the top. And he took trips to Venus and the moon and so on. <laughs> sure he did. Unfortunately, this causes more problem. This causes more pro causes more problems than the official governmental secrecy, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Ray, I thought a very fine article was recently done in True Magazine, October issue, I believe. Did you happen to read it? Yes, uh, it was written by Jacques Vallée, right. a French astronomer mathematician, who is also a consultant to NASA, by the way has come out with a book called Anatomy of a Phenomenon. It's published by the Henry Regnery Company in New York. It only costs four ninety five and it's one of the best books I feel ever written on the subject because here we have a professional astronomer who has access to f files including the Air Force unclassified section, by the way. This is a major breakthrough. The Air Force actually let this man come in and look at the unclassified section of their UFO files and files in Europe. Here we have this man with this reputation uh, coming out with a pro-UFO book, believing himself that the interplanetary answer is probably the correct answer. It's the first book by a professional astronomer advocating UFOs as being interplanetary vehicles. Well, now, Ray, with people like this, who obviously are intellectuals, going along with it, as you say, in a pro-category, why hasn't there been, for example, a congressional hearing to get into this thing a little further? One of the major reasons that NICAP was formed in 1956 was to promote open congressional hearings on UFOs. At that time, the former head of Central Intelligence Agency, uh, Vice Admiral Roscoe H. Hillenketter, came out with a statement to the press that the unknown objects are operating under intelligent control. It is imperative that we learn where they come from. He became the first head of NICAP's Board of Governors at that time. NICAP has tried over the years to obtain open congressional hearings, but even the lawmakers involved, congressmen involved who want open congressional hearings have failed time in and time out because of a uh, government clampdown. For example, Senator Stuart Symington in a public statement for NICAP states as this, the public has sound reason for being confused about this. The public should be given all information which would not adversely affect our national security. Uh, Senator Thomas J. Dodge says of his own committee, the Senate committee, UFOs have never been accurately explained. We, that is the Senate committee, don't have all the facts, and certainly the Senate committee should have all the facts. For the reasons that we've outlined before, and perhaps many other reasons, our government and the governments uh, throughout the world are reluctant to give any attention public-wise to the UFO problem at this time. And we feel it is high time that the American public should be told the truth about UFOs, at least 
a public information program sponsored by the government preparing the public bit by bit for what UFOs might be and, and what effect they could have on our society as we know it. Instead, the exact opposite seems to have taken place. Back in January 12, 1953, according to Edward J. Ruppel, former United States Air Force UFO project chief, he stated that on January 12, 1953, the Air Force invited a group of top scientists to look at their best UFO sightings. They gave this group of top scientists three alternatives. One, that UFOs were interplanetary. Two, that UFOs were not real and that the UFO project should close. Three, that the UFO project needed more data before they would give a conclusion. After examining this evidence, they came to the third conclusion. They felt that the UFO project needed more data and that to get this data that the UFO project should be quadrupled in size and that the public should be given all information concerning UFOs. Instead, in 1953, the Air Force project went completely underground and a complete system was set up to keep significant facts about UFOs from the public. I have a copy of their regulation right here. I could read you sections from this indicating that this is so. Well, Ray, you know, when you start talking about UFOs with the ordinary person, uh, for example, myself, I kind of feel that they do exist. I, I personally think we have intelligent life from somewhere else coming down here occasionally. Why don't they make themselves known is a question that's always asked. Why don't they show themselves? Uh, are they here to cause harm? Are they here to observe? What's their reason for coming? Again, all we can do is speculate, Alan. Well, let's, let's just speculate a little. My own theory is that there are very few of them, meaning people Whatever where, they, they, where are. they are, that most of these things are machines. And that since 1946, 1947, there were a few sightings during the war years, that they have been making an intensive survey of our planet. Lately, they seem to have taken an interest in people because cars have been chased, people have been chased along highways like the Exodus sighting and so forth. Mm -hmm. But there are very few of them and that they are vulnerable. For example, if one of these things was standing out in the field, I'm sure that perhaps with a 30-30 rifle, I might be able to knock him down. And in many cases where humanoids have been seen, the reaction of the, the witnesses has been to strike back or run. Unfortunately, another reason is if these things were hostile, and let's hope they aren't, they don't want us to know anything about them, as uh, little as possible, because of security reasons. One can speculate and speculate and, and, and still not be really sure uh, why they're here and what they want. But the fact remains that there is good observational evidence from people all over the world, including witnesses who are very good scientific backgrounds that there are objects coming into our atmosphere under intelligent control. Well, some years ago, wasn't there a uh, couple of airline pilots who, one of them in particular, claimed that an unidentified flying object flew beside his plane for some distance, and he described it like most UFOs are described, and then he finally went to the point of uh, saying, this is the captain, we'd like to have you look out at the port side, and uh, all the passengers looked out, and they saw this object too, and finally it took off in a big burst of speed and left, and he was left in the wake of the turbulence that it, that it left. Did you hear the, that report, Ray? Yes, there are many reports, <coughs> many reports concerning UFO sightings by airline pilots, so much so that in 1954, the United States Air Force met with heads of major airline companies and set up a regular UFO reporting network between the major airline companies and Project Blue Book. Unfortunately, the, because of the Air Force secrecy and ridicule and an order, Gen. 146, which forbids civilian airline pilots to discuss UFO sightings, having once reported them through official procedure, mm -hmm. airline pilots have the attitude that they don't want to report them to the Air Force. We get many sightings coming into NICAP that have not been reported to the Air Force by airline pilots. One of the men on our Board of Governors is Senior Captain William B. Nash, a pilot for over 16 years on Pan American Airways. And he stated, after getting a very close look at UFOs, I am certain that the UFOs we saw were intelligently operated craft from somewhere other than this planet. That's quite a statement to make, and yet what he saw convinced him immediately that there was nothing that, that we could have made that uh, performed like the UFOs he saw. 
Ray, we've got to pause here for just a moment. Ray and I are back here now. Uh, we we're just talking about a radar sighting that occurred that I think you all might be interested in. I was about to ask you anyway a little while ago, uh, what with all our equipment these days, electronically, did they ever follow these things for any distance on radar, and what conclusions did those sightings come to? Radar visual sightings are among the best because you see an object and it's tracked by several radars showing the object to be in the exact position as you see it. And there are many radar visual sightings made each year. One of the best, and which was mentioned by the former head of Project Blue Book, Ruppelt, in his book, took place at Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota, on August 12, 1953. Ground Observer Corps spotted an extremely bright light low on the horizon about 10 miles west of Ellsworth Air Force Base, and they reported it to the Air Defense Command radar station at Ellsworth. So they, they, they turned their radar to that section, uh, that sector, and picked up a target exactly where the Ground Observer Post said it was. The warrant officer said that it was real, well-defined, solid, and bright. It was not a weather target. It was a real, solid target. They called in height-finding radar, and it also confirmed the target. It was at 16,000 feet, just hovering there. Then the Ground Observer Corps reported that the target started to move southwest. Both radars confirmed the movements. The target moved over Rapid City, made a wide sweep around it, and returned to its original position. The light was seen by both radars now, visually by the Ground Observer Corps, and also by men who saw it visually outside the Air Defense Command radar post. So they sent up an F-84 F F jet. They vectored it into the target, and he saw it visually and closed to within three miles of the target. But as soon as he closed within three miles of the target, the object began to move. Pilot saw it move, the radar recorded its movement, ground observer course saw it move, and the F-84 chased it. But every time he got within three miles of it, it would just pick up a little speed and pull away. Well, the jet followed it for 120 miles and then had to turn back because of fuel. The UFO turned and followed the jet back to the base about 10 miles behind it. This was confirmed visually and by radar. So they scrambled another F-84. The pilot saw it right away and attempted to close in. Radar tracked both the jet and the UFO. Again, the UFO would not let that jet get closer than three miles. Then the pilot flipped on his radar ranging gun sight. In a few seconds, the red light on his sight blinked on and he realized that something real and solid was in front of him, not just a light. Uh, at this point, he was scared, and he received permission to break off the intercept. It was granted, and he returned to the base. The UFO did not return, but the Ground Observer Corps spotting, spotting post from the direction it was going reported all the way. Edward J. Ruppelt, head of the Project Blue Book, said this when he interviewed the, the pilot personally. Quote, when I talked to him, he readily admitted that he'd been scared. He had met MD-109s, FW-190s, and ME-262s over Germany, and he had met MiG-15s over Korea, but that large, bluish-white light had scared him. The sighting was thoroughly investigated. We looked into every facet of the incident. Nothing but a big question mark asking what it was remained. This is an unknown, and there are many, many, many more like this, Alan, from all over the world, objects seen in the daytime and confirmed by radar and, and visually. Well, Ray, I hope the day comes in our lifetime when they make themselves known or whatever to the human race and uh, we get together. What do you think? I'm hoping the day will come. I am very sympathetic with the Air Force uh, policy, our government's policy in one way. But Dr. Carl Jung, one of the world's, was one of the world's leading psychiatrists and a member of NICAP, wrote to NICAP and said that after looking into the best thing to do is to tell the public what... The UFOs are, as much as we know about them, and prepare the public that fear of the unknown is greater than fear of the known. Let's hope that our government does this soon. Well, it's been a very interesting hour, Ray. I still have about 40,000 questions I'd like to fire away, but our time is kind of up, and I know there are going to be a few people giving you a buzz on the phone. Anything you'd like to say in parting? Uh, thank you very much, Alan, for uh, having us here with you this morning, having me representing NICAP here. I would like to present you with a copy of the UFO evidence a document which was prepared specifically for Congress in 1964 by NICAP uh, covering UFO sightings between 1946 and 1964. And I'd like you to have this, and I hope it'll spur you on into further investigation of the subject. Thank you very much. I'll put this to work right after I get off the air this afternoon, that's for sure. Once again, Ray, many thanks. And thank you. We hope you stay tuned now for the news, which is coming up very shortly. And uh, 